Much of the innovation in orthopedics, can we put the slides up, please? Much of the innovation in orthopedics over the years has been in the creation of large chunks of metal and plastic, very effective innovation in the treatment of our patients. But we're now in a phase of orthopedics where we need to start to understand the biology of what's going on in our patients, but not just the biology of what's happening in the joints, but the biology of what's happening in the person as a whole. And it's very interesting to hear the previous talk uh, because there will be some similarities. Not that I'm going to talk about heart failure because it's not something I've seen or treated for many years, but the, the concepts around the impact of diabetes, of obesity, of metabolic syndrome, and the inflammatory components of osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is an inflammatory form of arthritis, not just a mechanical form. I am in receipt of an honorarium uh, in the delivery of these uh, uh, presentations. We all know that worldwide osteoarthritis is the most common joint disorder. Um, it accounts for massive amounts of disability and is associated in traditional sense with increasing age. But actually, that in itself is also changing. Globally, symptomatic hip and knee osteoarthritis is the most common. Is there a failure of design within our knee, knee joints? Actually, it's a bit like the idea of the neuroendocrine control of heart output. Our knee joints were designed for animals that actually don't live as long as we do. They were designed for impact, for, for running after uh, hunting and such things. But as a consequence of us living longer than, than maybe evolution uh, suggests we should, we actually wear out the, the articular cartilage and we develop osteoarthritis. But there is, in one sense, <clears throat> a design abnormality of this joint, of these joints, the knee joint being a very good example. The articular cartilage is an awful long way away from any blood supply whatsoever. You all know the blood supply of the knee, the knee joint, far better than I do. I'm a shoulder surgeon. The blood supply goes to the synovium. The synovium is a single cell thick in the normal joint. And the ultrafiltrate that comes from the synovium, the synovial fluid, is what feeds the chondrocytes within the articular cartilage. And so if something goes wrong with that, then those poor little chondrocytes are actually starved of substrate and starved of oxygen, and they can't do their job properly. So what we see as the endpoint of the osteoarthritic biology is degeneration of the articular cartilage. But actually, is that the initiating factor for the development of osteoarthritis. And I would like you to think that actually in many cases, what we're seeing is half an hour after the Big Bang. Whereas actually, in order to understand the etiology of osteoarthritis, we actually have to look at different mechanisms. And in particular, we have to consider the effect of damage to the synovium as being a significant component in the etiology of osteoarthritis. Lots of people <clears throat> present themselves uh, in the UK, everywhere, with osteoarthritis, particularly of the knee, but also of the hip. And there are variations. So in the West, uh, we have a, a clear risk factors for knee osteoarthritis, particularly female gender, but partly that's a reflection that us boys die before the girls do, and so that women live longer. Obesity is clearly a risk factor of the development of osteoarthritis. If you've had knee surgery or some form of trauma, yes, of course, knee arthritis will develop, and there may be some association with certain occupations and such things. How about here in, in Asia? Well, hip osteoarthritis seems to be a relatively uncommon, maybe not rare, but uncommon uh, problem in this part of the world. Uh, injury 
climbing stairs, according to this paper, 15 or more flights a day will give you hip arthritis. Uh, I, I don't know whether anybody has actually truly tried that. And carrying heavy weights. But as far as knee osteoarthritis is concerned, clearly there are similar risk factors to that found in, in the West. There is a massive burden of disease from all musculoskeletal diseases, so that it's in, in Europe, osteoarthritis is the eighth leading cause of the burden of disease as measured by dis disability-adjusted life years. And we also know that there are differences between males and females. So on the bottom are the, are the females, which is slightly shifted to an older age group. The synovium, what an incredible tissue. Very different to virtually any other tissue you find in the body. Most tissues, if they start to proliferate, once the cells touch each other, they stop growing. Not the synovium. Not the synovium at all. And so there is no contact inhibition of those cells. They continue growing. They continue to proliferate. They continue to form these fronds, these villi that we see within the joint. We did some, a little experiment. I'll just briefly show this. So the, um, the left-hand uh, uh, photograph is, is from a shoulder joint. And that shows some really quite early synovitis. There's been some trauma to that shoulder, but not too much. In the right-hand uh, uh, picture, you can see an inflammatory synovitis. And if we look at those histologically, they're very, very different. The, the inflammatory synovitis has a lot of inflammatory cells, they're particularly monocytes. So the synovium is made up of a combination of synovial fibroblasts and monocytes. So the monocytes proliferate massively. And so we fed these cells with interleukin I1 beta. It's a very small study, hydrocortisone and hyaluronan. And the most important thing to hear is that the interleukin line, that the interleukin actually caused proliferation of these synovial fibroblasts, but actually decreased the migration. So these cells were, were proliferating, um, but they weren't coming together, they weren't joining up and actually stopping that proliferation. So a, a, a very simple inflammatory stimulus causes massive uh, proliferation of these cells. So we need to ask ourselves, what is the role of, in the etiology of, uh, of osteoarthritis for the, the, sin, the synovium and the synovitis and its progression to the development of the, the clinical uh, entity of osteoarthritis? Is it just a reaction to other things going on that joint, in that joint, or is it a, one of the primary or the primary tissue that, met, that undergoes changes in the development of osteoarthritis? Obesity. Well, it's, we know, a global problem. These are just you know, a selection of curves, mostly from Western countries. Um, in the last couple of years, our chief medical officer in the UK has said that obesity is not a medical condition. I think it's generally accepted that obesity actually is a medical condition because it has an effect on your life expectancy. And it creates other health problems. The BMI, which is the easiest thing to measure, varies between Western society and here in Asia. So the, uh, the BMI for being overweight in most of Asia is actually 24, not 25. We're doing some work in Malaysia. And in Malaysia has the, the biggest percentage of people who are overweight or obese amongst the Southeast Asian population. And 44.2% is actually more than that um, uh, and, and is becoming increasingly a big problem. 2013 figures, 2.1 billion people obese globally. I saw some figures yesterday which actually, for 2016, 2.8 billion people are obese. So we're talking about, we have a world population of 7 billion people now, so that we're talking about 40% of the world's population are obese. Here in India, you have 270 million people below the poverty line. But in 2014, it's the third most obese country in the world. And according to the Times of India in 2016, um, India, most underweight people, ranks fifth in obesity. If you, if you do that in terms of numbers of people, 3.7% of the global obese men are here in India, and 5.3% of the global obese women 
are here in India. 20% of your children are overweight or obese. In generally, the 20% are overweight for children is across many countries. Obesity rates are said to be stable in Western uh, countries, uh, but now it's becoming a problem, increasingly a problem, of poorer people. But there's also a concept that everybody now needs to understand in relation to obesity. That is the malnourished obese individual. And this is a lack of a variety of micronutrients which affects the general metabolism within that individual. So somebody may be fat, but they're actually also malnourished. And we know that generally public health initiatives have actually failed really quite badly. When we're looking at the percent body fat, we need to understand the visceral versus the subcutaneous fat. So waist to hip ratio is a very simple way of doing it. There are more complicated ways of measuring the visceral fat. The important issue here is the fat that sits around your gut in particular is highly pro-inflammatory. Many of these people and will have abnormal lipid profiles, but there are also some people who have an apparently normal BMI, but also an abnormal lipid profile. And there's this oddity of the, the, the obesity paradox. As one gets a little bit older into the seventh and early eighth decades, it's actually quite useful for survival to be a little bit overweight. Not grossly obese, but a little bit overweight. But what are the, the risks of developing obesity? This is a very simple uh, diagram showing the sorts of things that happen. So the important ones are the development of type 2 diabetes, the development of uh, uh, fatty liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, cardiovascular disease, uh, pro probably also Alzheimer's, but also certainly osteoarthritis. Metabolic syndrome, disorder of energy utilization and storage, diagnosed by a co-occurrence of three out of five of the following medical conditions, abdominal, visceral obesity, elevated blood pressure, elevated fasting uh, glucose, and high triglycerides or low HDL. So if you've got three out of the five of those, you are likely to have metabolic syndrome. And what happens if you've got that? If you've got normal uh, adipocytes, they've got a blood supply. Once they become fat, they actually lose that blood supply and they become more and more uh, ischemic. Um, some of them will actually die because of that ischemia, but actually many of them will continue to function, but they will, will, will produce pro-inflammatory adipokines. And there will be a decrease in the anti-inflammatory I can't even say the word, sorry, <laughs> adipokines. Um, uh, this results in inflammation, and what we're interested in here in relation to osteoarthritis is this systemic inflammation. And then all the other things that we've already talked about, the diabetes, the fatty liver, etc., etc. So our modern lifestyle, where we, we're eating too much, we're eating the wrong things, we're not taking exercise, gives rise to the obesity, the abnormal lipid profiles, and um, in particular, some cellular mechanisms uh, which will cause chronic low-grade inflammation. And you'll see in that, that box, the first box there, increased endoplasmic reticulum stress response. That is, uh, causes early aging, and that's then associated with all the clinical conditions that we actually see. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to dwell on this for, for very long, but one of the most important mechanisms here is that uh, in response to this, these cells floating around in this abnormal soup, and if, if I don't know whether anybody's actually taken a blood uh, sample from patients who have really abnormal lipid profiles, but it looks like red cream, really quite nasty stuff. And the inflammatory cells such as monocytes circulating around the body are exposed to this red cream, and as a result of that, the endoplasmic reticulum responds in what's called an unfolded protein response. The, the, the proper production of those proteins is lost. That is inflammatory, pro-inflammatory in itself, and so we get into a positive feedback mechanism by which inflammation is increased. And so if you've got somebody who is obese, they've got diabetes, they've got other things that are stimulating inflammation, that inflammation becomes worse and worse as time goes by. And so we have a combination of endoplasmic stress, uh, endoplasmic reticulum stress response, 
and oxidative stress response reduction of reactive oxidative species. And we get, get all of these different conditions um, that we see uh, in, in many patients as they are not getting older. These are actually getting younger. So that metabolic syndrome is now something that's appearing in people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, not just in, in older life. We've just uh, completed a very small study in, in Malaysia, 175 participants. 91% have some form of dyslipidemia. 43% type 2 diabetes, 56% cardiovascular disease. There were very few people, I think it was five or six, who had a normal BMI. Many of these patients were literally undiagnosed, and even those who were diagnosed, many of them did not comply with their therapy. So this is a big problem. You can extrapolate that to all sorts of different places. So what about this combination of osteoarthritis and obesity? Well, there, clearly there are some patients who injure their, their, their joints. They actually physically damage the articular cartilage. If we look at that in the arthroscope or directly, we can see that that cartilage is abnormal. It's a different color. It, it just looks, and, and that's, that's, gonna, that's gonna develop, that's gonna degenerate and develop into osteoarthritis. But many of the patients, we don't get a history of trauma, but we do see the increased incidence of what we would refer to as primary osteoarthritis. And we need now to consider that osteoarthritis is an inflammatory condition and that it meets the metabolic syndrome, which we are increasingly seeing in the obese population with their diabetes, with their hypertension, with their abnormal triglycerides, and, and so that the we have the intra-articular inflammatory response in the synovium that's exacerbated by systemic inflammation. That results into poor cartilage nutrition and cellular function, and then we see progressive changes. So osteoarthritis is not just a mechanical damage to the joint cartilage. There is an inflammatory component in every single case, but in many, it may be the most important uh, issue is the synovitis. Obesity, also part of metabolic syndrome, pro-inflammatory, there are common cellular mechanisms. So slightly, t I, I suppose, tongue-in-cheek in one sense, because osteoarthritis has been put in the middle here, maybe we should put obesity in the middle or something, but essentially what we're saying is that all these conditions are very, very closely linked, um, and they are all working in concert to give you a disabled, unwell uh, individual who is unlikely to live into old age. If we look at the data from the National Joint Register in the UK, the number of joint replacements is still increasing. The number of obese patients who are receiving joint replacements is increasing. Though in, in the UK now, some people, some surgeons are saying if, if, if the BMI is over 35, they're not going to get an operation. But most importantly, from the NGR data and other data, the patients who are receiving uh, their first joint replacements are becoming younger and younger. And these are all obese patients. Very briefly, I just wanted to, uh, to, to show you uh, the earlier results of an experiment which has now gone to a much bigger study. Um, what we're looking at is, is trying to measure the inflammation. And there's a molecule called S100A8A9, which is actually a, a docking protein for, uh, for monocytes as they go from the, the circulation into the, 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 into the tissue, so that from being monocytes in circulation to being tissue macrophages, they lose a protein, which we, we can measure uh, uh, very easily. If, that, uh, if the S100A9 uh, increases, that means that more monocytes are being recruited. And we started off this, this experiment because we were interested in aseptic loosening. But it became apparent, and th uh, this, this part was based around nearly 2,000 blood samples, We've actually got now nearly 6,000 blood samples and, and uh, uh, in the process of analyzing a very big, this very big data set. So what we did, standard uh, tests for, for function, but we also measured the S100A8A9. In, in our group in, in the UK, the majority of patients were overweight or, a bit overweight or obese, more so in, in those needing knee replacements than those when, uh, in needing hip replacements. Um, in the, uh, of the normal weight patients, most of those were actually older rather than younger. And actually, the other thing that came out of this, has, has come out of this study, is that there are some gender-specific changes in both platelets and monocytes, both of which are involved in the inflammatory response that we're interested in. 
We do well as orthopedic surgeons. We replace joints, patients get better. So SF12, a joint-specific score, they all get better. But also, interestingly, the level of inflammation decreases, measured systemically, when we replace those joints. It never goes down to normal. That might be because other joints are involved, but actually it's also due to the fact that these patients have systemic inflammation from other causes. So joint replacement does reduce that, that inflammation. And, and we can, what we can say from these data is that inflammation impacts negatively on joint function, but also that by reducing that inflammation, by uh, performing an arthroplasty, um, it shows that the osteoarthritis has an inflammatory driver there which is contributing uh, to the systemic uh, uh, effects of the inflammation. The speakers at the, this, these meetings have been asked to talk about innovation. I found it very difficult <clears throat> to actually come up with anything that I could really call innovation in the treatment of osteoarthritis because actually there is nothing at the moment. Obviously, obesity is, is a general problem, and the most effective way of trying to reduce obesity is actually going to be nutritional, nutritional education, but not of individuals, but of families. There's no point in taking dad or mum or one child and saying, lose weight. That's never going to happen. It's got to be the whole family that's got to be you know, treated on that. Maybe curbs on food products in the UK. There are moves to uh, reduce sugar within uh, fizzy drinks and things like that. And pharmaceuticals, things like Xenical are used uh, in some patients, but they're, they're really a short-term effect. They're massive side effects. And rather like uh, you know, uh, felons, fat people tend to be repeat offenders, I'm afraid. It's very difficult to maintain a, a, a decreased weight for somebody who uh, starts off fat. Well, what about osteoarthritis? What, what have we got out there? Well, weight loss and exercise really is the best way of trying to reduce the effects of the osteoarthritis that once it's started, we can't stop it progressing. But actually, that's not really practical in the face of severe pain, and there is no real pain-modifying therapy out there that is really effective. What about stem cell therapies? Mesenchymal stem cells, circulating stem cells, adipose-derived stem cells. Those are the, the three modalities that are, that are available at the moment. Hypothetically, mesenchymal stem cells are the most effective because they're the best. But actually, the numbers decrease very significantly with age, such that there are very, very few of them in somebody who's 60 or so. They're difficult to harvest because they're, they're stuck in little lacunae within the bone marrow. Um, and we need to know how to, to make them proliferate into cartilage, it, down the cartilage lineage. And that's actually very difficult to do. Small-scale studies on isolated cartilage defects, billions of dollars of, of research investment, virtually always fibro cartilage is produced. Circulating stem cells. There are people who claim that they'll take a blood sample from you, take the stem cells out, inject it in your joints, and your osteoarthritis is, is, is cured. What a load of nonsense. The majority of the circulating stem cells are actually hemopoietic. Um, the experiments that are reported are actually fundamentally flawed and I think totally unethical. Adipose derived stem cells becoming the flavor of the month because it, it seems to be fairly easy to actually isolate these. But again, how do we make them proliferate and follow a cartilage lineage? There's lots of stories surrounding adipose derived stem cells at the moment which say they're wonderful, they're great, they're going to be the cure all for osteoarthritis. An early study published showed uh, using uh, adipose-derived stem cells plus hyaluronan showed, showed some pain reduction, and the, these things were safe. But no difference in terms of the osteoarthritis whatsoever. And I have to say, I would find it very surprising if they do have a positive effect. What you need to remember, if you're putting these cells into a knee joint, that is a hostile environment. It's not a nice, pristine, uh, uninflamed, wonderfully nutrient-rich environment of the normal knee or the normal hip or whatever it happens to be. You've got a patient who is obese. You've got a patient who's got diabetes. You've got a patient who's got systemic inflammation. You've got a patient who's got synovitis. And so these cells have got to try and survive in this hostile environment. The chondrocytes still need nutrition. They also need loading 
our cells, musculoskeletal cells, always need loading in order to get to where they want to be. And what about a scaffold? What do we use for mesenchymal stem cells or any other of those stem cell derivatives? Is it a 2D or a 3D scaffold? And what material? And do we need growth factors? There's virtually no experiments studying mesenchymal stem cells and or chondrocytes in this, this hostile environment. We're actually just about to start some experiments in rats, diabetic rats. There is nothing out there. And so if you stick these cells into this hostile environment, what are they going to do? They're going to say goodbye. And that's all they're going to do. They're not going to grow into articular cartilage. PRP. This is, you know, the, the, the world is making vast, or the, the orthopedic industry or whoever, is making vast amounts of money out of PRP. What a waste of time. It has absolutely no useful effect in any of the pathologies in which it has been used. It may cause some short-term improvement in pain, but the fact is the, the, the contents of platelets is, are incredibly complex. 1,500 growth factors. What are they doing? We don't know. Hyaluronan, it is not effective, and the FDA have recently ruled it's a complete waste of time. So, again, that, you know, as far as hyaluronan is concerned, this is a complex model. It has a, a molecule. It has different sizes some of which are pro-inflammatory, some of which are anti-inflammatory. So there's a, a, a lack of understanding of the, the complex nature of the hyaluronan molecule. So patients who are obese with osteoarthritis re re require joint arthroplasty at a mean of 59 ages. That's from our study based on 3,000 patients. Patients with age-related hypertension, so they don't have metabolic syndrome, 74 years. So if you've got metabolic syndrome, you are 15 years younger in your first joint replacement. So obesity is not just, a, uh, uh, obesity, not just a problem of weight in terms of the development of osteoarthritis. We have very good existing treatments for the osteoarthritis, but what's the future? Probably the use of stem cells in some way, but actually we need to do a lot more work to understand it. So Obesity, metabolic syndrome, and osteoarthritis, they all contribute to the total systemic inflammatory load. Joint arthroplasty reduces the measurable inflammatory load, but never to normal. And of course, osteoarthritis affects multiple joints. So there's lots of inflammatory stimulus there. And many of these patients have mo multiple comorbidities. So we conclude that the inflammatory components of obesity and osteoarthritis interact. The molecular mechanisms are probably related to endoplasmic reticulum stress uh, responses, but joint arthroplasty does reduce inflammation. We've got a global issue here. It's an increasing problem globally, uh, uh, but in the West, maybe obesity rates are stabilized. From an orthopedic point of view, we're doing joint replacements younger because of the obesity and the metabolic syndrome, not because what we do is actually is better. We need to have health improvement strategies that target both problems, especially in younger people. And as far as innovation in the future, we actually need to understand the fundamental research of chondrocytes and, and the related tissues within the joint and not go straight for product development, which, is the, which has been the case in the majority of the, the, the so-called innovations and the treatment of osteoarthritis. Thank you.